Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Mark, welcome back to the Australian Investors Podcast, mate. Thanks for having me, Owen. Always great to be back. Always good to chat to you. Um, just reviewing one of your recent episodes on the RAST Network, uh, it was as you now know, one of the most popular YouTube videos we've ever done. Um, and it was also, I think, in the top five of uh, just standard audio-only episodes as well. So, Matt, you really hit it out of the park with that last one. And I'll put links in the show notes um, for anyone that hasn't heard or, or seen that. Um, but not to, not to put any pressure on you, but uh, maybe you're, you're in form at the moment, so we're going to tackle some really juicy topics. Um, it's, a team, it's a team effort, Owen, so I need you to also uh, drag me through the next one as well. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I'm the anchor in this and I'm just I'm slowing you down. But um, we're going to talk about 10 reasons why ETFs are better than property in retirement. Now, this is quite a provocative thing, uh, and we're going to go through each of those 10 things. You can tell us uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening back, you can tell us what you think. Um, We've also had a lot of comments on those, that previous video. So let us know what you think. We're going to talk about ETFs. We're going to talk about different things. And yes, we're probably talking our own book here because I'm a big fan of ETFs. I invest in ETFs. Mark works for Global X, which is a sponsor of the podcast. So yes, we get all of that, but we're going to have a bit of fun and we are going to bring to you the merits of using ETFs, which is, I think Mark, it's probably fair to say it's what we're both seeing. Like when we talk to investors, we're seeing more people use ETFs at this stage of their life. Yeah, definitely. I think we're seeing whether you've got your young accumulators who are trying to like build wealth and start on that capital growth journey, whether those approaching their like drawdown phase, retirement, people looking for income, ETFs can tick all those boxes. Um, there's, you know, around about 400 ETFs at, in the market at the moment, plenty more to come. So there's really an ETF to cater for every uh, particular goal or any particular investment need. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm going to start with some icebreakers though, made a bit of fun. Um, what was your most recent investment? Oh, you know me, Owen, I'm, I'm a pretty boring investor. I just uh, DCA into a very boring diversified portfolio. Um, I did recently add a little bit of um, US Treasury bond exposure, um, yeah. just in terms of where we're seeing, you know, US interest rates potentially falling, uh, a little bit of a flight to safety as well. Um, so that's just a bit of ballast into the portfolio. Um, but also on a, on a non-investment side, which I always love, I also invested in a bike um, just to try and do a bit more exercise, um, save a little bit of money as well, getting to and from work. Uh, so yeah, we don't have the same public transport as, as Melbourne, um, in terms of the, the grid, but in Sydney, uh, yeah, recently invested in a bike and, uh, yeah, in, enjoying every minute of it for the time being. Well, that's, that's, that's an investment in your health, um, and probably saves you money longer term, as long as you, well, unless you're one of those finance people that like calculates how much, um, it's going to save you if you do X number of trips. I remember trying to do that with a coffee machine and then I just completely uh, lost track. I, I know some people try and do that. Um, I remember, but like. You could be, and I mean, I'm a bit of a spreadsheet nerd, but at the end of the day, it's more a psychology feel and a like non-financial attribute as well. So you could live your life by a spreadsheet, but that's not how it works to real people. So the, the cost saving is like one element to it, but it's more just the exercise since I moved homes, which um, I think we'll, we'll talk about as well, a little bit closer to, to the mm. CBD. Um, but yeah, you can't live your life by a spreadsheet. There's much more, uh, more yes. to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been, a, been a nice journey so far. It's one of those things, um, well, most things I, I, I once read in a Peter O'Malley book, which is a real estate book, um, that people buy emotionally, but justify logically, um, you know, like, oh, you know, I, I bought the coffee machine, but I'm going to use it two times a day, you know, and these types of things, which is, is very common with investors as well. So second icebreaker question for you, Mark, is the, the best investment blog or podcast episode it could be any like type of resource that you've consumed recently. Yeah, I actually listened to something um, a couple of days ago, Owen, which could be quite topical. Um, there's a podcast called Behind the Memo um, by um, Howard Marks, um, okay. who runs the um, Oak Tree Capital, um, you know, one of the best investment writers. And he uh, had an interview with um, someone I know you know uh, or follow quite well, which is Morgan Housel. Um, oh, yeah. He is the uh, he's the author at the Collaborative Fund, but he also wrote the Psychology of Money book, which is one of my favorite. Um, mm. and Howard Marks, and I recommend anyone to actually uh, subscribe to Howard Marks memos that he writes, um, every so often, but he wrote a note, um, that was entitled how I think about debt. Um, and he explores it from more a philosophical and psychological perspective. 
Um, the key idea was really though, as debt increases, so does the narrow, it narrows the range of outcomes you can endure in life. Whereas when you don't have debt, you obviously have a lot more freedom to play. Um, and he talks about a whole bunch of things. So I highly recommend your viewers have a, uh, have a listen to it, but he references like the 08, 09 memo that he wrote where he talked about volatility plus leverage equals dynamite. But the interesting thing that I really found uh, quite fascinating was that the, the podcast discussed a guy by the name of, um, Rick Guren. Guren was his name, oh, Rick yeah. Guren. He was a partner with Warren Buffett at Charlie Munger at Berkshire Hathaway. Um, mm. but he's not very well known because he lost everything in the 1970s market crash because he used leverage and um, a margin loan as well. Um, and Buffett's quote, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something along the lines of, Rick was just as smart as us, but he was in a hurry. And he ended up having to sell his shares to Warren, um, like his Berkshire shares. So it's an interesting take on, on debt. Um, and the key takeaway I found was um, people need to maximize um, or need to focus on mac maximizing endurance rather than maximizing returns. And that mm. endurance is both emotionally and financially. So you can't just avoid risk altogether because then you're avoiding return potential, but just manage the level of debt prudently that you can sleep well at night because, and, and Housel talks about this, about this idea of this financial instability hypothesis, I think it's called, where it's like when you, within a period of no recessions, that leads to more optimism, which leads to more debt, which leads to more economic fragility, which leads to a recession and the cycle just continues. So I'm not saying that we're heavily indebted at the moment. There's a lot of evidence which suggests we can service it. But yeah, just another interesting, interesting. take on, on debt. Um, so yeah, it's called Behind the Memo, The Impact of Debt. Um, highly recommend the podcast and also the reading the memo as well. I am going to listen to this in Impact of Debt. I've got it. I'll pop it in the show notes for folks that um, or in the YouTube description for folks that are interested in it as well. Anything of Morgan's I'm keen to consume. We have had him on the show once before. Uh, which is wonderful. And I, I think I have heard um, Buffett talk about Rick Guren uh, before. I think when he's, when people have asked the questions at the AGMs about debt and some of the experiences that he brings up, I think that's one that he's brought up once or twice. Fascinating, mate. That's really good. Okay. Our final one is, and it might be related to this, uh, is what's one thing that you've learned or relearned about investing in the past 12 months? This is, yeah, a really good question as well. I think one of the things, and I'm, I'm doing a lot of research at the moment, and just to see what's been going on with a lot of companies reaching record valuations, I'm, I'm learning and relearning, I guess, the fact that share markets follow earnings over time. It's a very simple, uh, mm. tried and tested approach, but a lot of people forget it because over the short term, things like market sec sentiment and psychology can drive what's called multiple expansion, which is just uh, another way of saying how much willing how much investors are willing to pay for a dollar of earnings but over the long term it's really earnings growth that drives the majority of the returns of share prices um and there was a great piece um from jp morgan's michael sembalist his name is um it was a piece called a severe case of covidia so it, you know combining both um covid and nvidia but it's really talking about this ai driven us equity market and there was a great chart in there which showed um nvidia compared to cisco and a lot of people are comparing you know is this time different um, but the thing that was different is, um, you know, Cisco share price during the 1990s and early 2000s went up, but their earnings was like way below their share price. And then the earnings troughed, which declined. Whereas NVIDIA, their share price has skyrocketed. But if you look at their like earnings per share growth on a forward looking basis, it continues that same line. So over the short term, yes, um, market sentiment drives prices, but over the long term, you really got to focus on earnings growth. That's, that's the key lesson that I have uh, relearned once again. I love that. Um, and yeah, the longer you stretch that out, the more you realize that how that plays out, right? Not, not just as you mentioned on a stock specific basis, but also on a market basis. And that's oh, why yeah. when people, you know, throw things out, like the U S market isn't an all time high sell. Now I always think about like, well, we will U S companies continue to grow probably, you know, and will they be one of the best, you know, countries to support growth? Probably. Um, we don't know the answers for sure, but I think about that a lot as well. Um, mate, now, we're going to get into these 10 things in just a moment. I've got one final question for you, which is something that you did email me uh, yesterday, I believe it was. Um, you've had a bit of a what what we shall call a property experience recently, and I'll let you go into how much detail you want to go into. But um, as an investor for quite a while now, um, being in you know the share market e side, not just that, but like multi-asset side of things, how was the experience and also... Were there any surprises or affirmations that you experienced? 
Yeah, an- another good question, Owen. And I think when I heard the topic you want to speak about, I actually thought it's a perfect opportunity because I, I did recently purchase a place with my partner. Um, and I think it's great because one of my goals of investing through ETFs over the last decade or so has been to buy a home, to, to purchase the property. We, we know a property, particularly in Sydney, is incredibly expensive. Same in Melbourne um, and the rest of Australia. So it, one, it teaches a lesson of if you just be a little bit patient and just steadily compound over time, you can achieve those goals. Um, I had a, kind of like a 10-year time frame. Some might have shorter, some might have longer. But one, the power of ETFs, which has literally been the majority of my portfolio, has helped me get there. Um, not entirely, but it has been a, a huge part. Um, but, you know, go, going through the property experience, Owen, I kind of had this, and we were talking off air about it, is property is a great avenue to build wealth, um, but it's not the only avenue to build wealth. And I think um, you forget um, the, the perks of things like renting around flexibility, lifestyle, not dealing with headaches. But I was just, in terms of the, the things that were eye-opening for me, was just around how much cost is involved. And we'll dive into it, but whether you're talking about stamp duty, building and pest inspections, uh, legal fees, settlement fees, bank fees, um, even to get a strata report on the the, the unit that I bought, like there's all these fees. Um, And I was also shocked to know, even though I was on the buying side this time, but, you know, real estate agents, it's it's interesting. It's one of the few professions I I had a a, a profound realization where commissions have stayed relatively stable over time, but the asset values have keep going higher and higher. Whereas if you think about the finance industry, Share markets have gone over time, but you've seen compression within fees mm. and financial advice and ETFs. So it's kind of like the polar opposite. Um, Good for real estate agents. Yeah, exactly. Exactly <laughs> right. And I, look, they have their purpose um, of what they need to do. Um, but the other thing that was interesting was, well, we also renovated the place as well. Um, and yeah, just around the, the cost involved, the time involved, um, dealing with things like strata approval, noise complaints. Um, yeah, th- 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 there's a bit of side to property, which I didn't really know mm. about um so it's not all you know you know the grass is not always green on that side it's great to be in the market um but i still see place for both property and and share investing or etf investing within the portfolio um so it's great to be on the property ladder um but yeah it, it's not the be all and end all and, and that's why you know you've still got two um, about a third of australians who still rent and then a third who own and a third who have a mortgage yeah it's um it's it's really interesting that you bring that up and I must admit like someone who owns my own home obviously it's been quite liberating um having the ability to kind of put a hole in the wall and that's okay um but th- I think the thing that some share market investors miss about property other than just like the ability to use leverage which you mentioned before like, I love that dynamite quote from Howard Marks but um the ability to use debt in Australia sensibly is kind of like a superpower for property and it's very unique to property but the other thing is that I've found, which um, people underestimate, is they just compare like you know the returns of shares to the returns of property, not really realizing that there's this personal finance aspect which can make property really valuable. So like you can redraw equity against it, you could um, you know refinance, you could use that to buy another property or invest in ETFs or invest in shares. Um, there's so many different things that are available when you do own a home versus renting that people don't immediately understand. But once you understand the tax and the, that personal finance ang- aspect, it does make a lot of sense. And the reason I bring that up is kind of like to kind of get in front of what we're about to say, which is like when you transition to relying on a portfolio, I'm of the personal opinion, and I've held this for a very long time, is that shares or ETFs, mainly ETFs, are a superior way to allocate your money and to create and to hold on to wealth and to use it to produce income. So we're going to talk through some of the reasons why that might be the case. But what we're here, to, what we're also going to say is it's not necessarily one or the other. We're just trying to present a very strong view for why people should consider ETFs. Not to say that never buy property. I think that would be a mistake to to kind of let that out. But we're going to step through these, mate, one at a time. Um, you just mentioned that you know, you've been going through this process. You even did a reno, which I, I, I mean, I, yeah, I know all about that. I think shows like, um, I can't remember those reno shows, but they make it seem glamorous. Like they make it seem like you can just design this beautiful bathroom in like 24 hours, but it is not at all like that. Um, so it's, def- uh, that's- it's a, it's a financial toll. It's an emotional toll. It's psychological. It's, it's all the above. And it's now funny. My, my fiance and I, we, we are now getting recommended these reels on Instagram and YouTube shorts of like what it's like to go through a renovation. So look, great way. And um, Aussies love their property. They love renovating. It's a great way to add value to the home. 
We'll talk about some of the perks and some of the negatives around, you know, house prices rising over time, not taking into account the renovation side as well. Um, but yeah, look, it was a great journey to, to go through, but, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'll do it again, Owen, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. The living renos in particular, I can, I can vouch for that are, are pretty horrendous, but mate, the first, um, cab off the rank, the first reason why people should consider using ETFs is, um, the idea of speed of transaction. So some people might call this liquidity. Um, how do you think about this? Yeah. And I think, um, when you think about ETFs, the, the speed of transaction is one of the perks, but just because ETFs trade every single day, doesn't mean that you should, you know, mm. they, so there are some ETFs that are short-term trading tools, but I think the important thing is that liquidity aspect. So ETFs trade on the stock exchange, you can buy and sell, um, just like you would any other normal share. Whereas the property process can take months to finalize. And that's what I found with purchasing my place is from everything from the selling, having to, you know, list the property to then having inspections to then having to wait till, till settlement. And if you look at the median days on market, which is just another way of saying how long a property is normally on the market before it, it's sold, it's around about 30 to 40 days if you look across Australia. So you're looking multiple months um, to actually, you know, transact on a particular property. Whereas ETFs offered that flexibility, um, particularly for retirees who are needing access to funds quite quickly. There's no real transaction delays. You do have that, you know, ASX T plus two settlement time, but you know, the US has moved to T plus one. There's talk of going to T plus zero of near instantaneous transactions. Um, whereas with property, you've, well, so you've got the ASX clearinghouse, which handles um, the ETF and the shared trading um, settlement. You've got a, a, an institution called PEXA, um, on the property side, which mm. handles that clearinghouse, but there's a still a lot of, not, not necessarily risk involved, but you've got to make sure both banks are talking to one another with property. And my bank had a few administrative issues and almost missed the settlement time. So I was, you know, freaking out being like, guys, what the hell is going on over here? Um, so having that, I guess, from, from an ETF standpoint, having that ASX clearinghouse is important. Um, and, and not just that, that I believe in market timing. I think obviously we've heard the tried and tested time in the market is, is better than timing. But if you do think that, you know, markets are at risk of selling down, you know, to, to list a property straight away, you know, these market cycles happen very quickly. So if you do want to take a little bit of risk off the table, ETFs provide a great way to do it. Um, there's efficient rebalancing as well. So if you have um, alignment with certain retirement goals, you could rebalance from growth and defensive assets. So to sum that up, Owen, I'd say that ETFs are just a faster and a near instantaneous execution and settlement, whereas um, property is just a longer, more complex process. Maybe it's a feature um, or, or a bug, but overall, some people do like that transaction speed and that high velocity overall. Yeah, there's, a, there's this emergence of these um, daily indices for property. So people know that they can tune into the news or just Google, you know, ASX 200, S&P 500, all ordinaries, whatever, and it comes up instantly. Like, it might be like a 20-minute delay on the actual number, but it's there. Um, and now some property groups are trying to give you an estimate of the property like value or price every single minute of every day, which for me is scary because if more people knew what that meant, they would probably be more impulsive. Um, yeah. I think as well, Owen, one, one of the good things actually about property investors is that they don't check their portfolios mm. every day. So I actually think that that's what I was talking about, it actually being a feature rather than a bug. And that's something that ETF investors can probably learn from property investors is that not to check their portfolios mm -hmm. every day because the vast evidence shows the more you transact, the more you check, the worse you're going to actually do. So yeah, I, I do understand people want transparency, particularly topical right now in Australia around illiquid assets and getting more transparency, getting more real-time data rather than waiting on independent valuations. But yeah, I, I think there is something that ETF investors can take away from property investors. Yeah, it's um. I also, as you were talking about like rebalancing from like growth investments, like shares into bonds or cash or deep, different things that you can do with an ETF portfolio, a lot of people have pre-built rules for that. So it can kind of like trigger, like I'm going to sell when it's 10% out of balance or whatever. But I was reminded of the time during COVID. Um, some people may be familiar. Um, I can't remember the exact figure, but there was some big, one of the big yellow banks came out and said that they think property prices could fall up to 30% or something like this. Now, if, if you were in that situation where you were like, well, maybe that's an opportunity to get in or to get out. If you have to wait a few months to action that decision on your portfolio, the opportunity could be gone. And that's kind of what we saw in COVID, but this is a V shape straight down, straight back up. Um, and if you had an ETF portfolio, you could have just tilted the portfolio and reacted in a way. I remember people were 
tilting into different like credit type ETFs and different types of um, bond ETFs and, and these types of things at the time. And it seems like just really intelligent thing to do. I'm going to jump. That's a great, I think that's a great thing. Just quickly, I just to add about ETFs is you can have rules based algorithms or a rebalancing uh, policy in place, whether you do it on a you know frequency basis, whether it's monthly, quarterly, or it's like a threshold base. If a, mm -hmm. something falls 10%, you can buy more of this. And there's plenty of apps and platforms that can allow it. Not the same with property. Very hard to have kind of that rules-based algorithm that can have a steady rebalancing process. So yeah, just something I wanted to add. Yeah, no, fair enough. And um, we are talking about 10 reasons why ETFs are better than property for retirement. So this is a particular stage in life. And I wanted to jump to the fifth thing that we have on our list. I'm going to kind of go from one to five, but don't worry, we'll cover two, three, four as well, which is this idea of liquidity, which we did mention, which is slightly, it's related to speed and, and the ability to transact. But it's slightly different. And this is important in retirement, Mark, the liquidity in retirement. How would you explain this piece? Yeah, I think it's important in, in retirement, particularly Owen, because um, things change when people approach retirement. There could be things like financial situations change, health reasons can happen. Um, so you want that immediate access to cash, um, particularly for those in retirement or kind of, you know, thinking about their estate planning needs as well. Um, those in drawdown phase as well, looking to take, um, you know, meet their needs of taking 4% out of their, their, their mm. super once they read their pension phase, you, you can't really take 4% out of property. You know what I mean? Um, I think th there was an analogy used, Owen, oh, in, in our emails, you, you know, you can't sell a certain portion of the house or like sell a fridge or sell a sink to, to fund a expense. You know, it just doesn't work that way. So ETFs do allow retirees to sell a portion of their holdings, um, mm. enabling them to withdraw funds when they may need it. Um, and not to say that they need to withdraw it every time. There are certain rules that need to be met. Um, but I think in terms of that retirement phase, particularly when cash flow is important, you know, when, when, when you're young, you've got all the, you've got the health, you've got the time. Whereas when you're in retirement, you know, you, you may not have the health, you may not have the time, but you do have the capital and you want to be able to access that capital. So I think particularly as we're talking about, you know, goals-based advice and that next generational transfer of wealth, it's a lot easier from an ETF perspective to do it versus a property perspective. So yeah, mm. having that immediate access to cash, particularly for retirees, um, incredibly important. And it also brings peace of mind, doesn't it? Like when you, if you think about like the COVID crash, not that we're saying, you know, you should act in these types of things, but if your advisor that you're seeing in retirement has the ability to help you shift the portfolio, or let's say worst case scenario, as you said, someone passes away that manages the family wealth, it's so much easier for the next, uh, in, uh, you know, the, the next person to manage that. So whether it's the executor, the trustee, the advisor, the children, your husband, your wife, whatever, so much easier for them to kind of make the estate work, to make distributions, to do all that sort of stuff. Um, okay. So that's number five. We'll go back to number two on my list, Mark, which was lower costs. I actually found something in preparation for this because I don't have an investment property, right? But I, I was trying to figure out how much would it actually cost ongoing? And you referred to this. And I found this article from realestate.com.au uh, or REA Group that said the average property management fee for rental properties in Australia is typically around 5 to 10%. And it varies by state. But I was blown away by that. Because when we're talking about ETFs, we're talking about a lot lower costs. I, I don't know. That, let's use that as a base. But why are ETFs lower cost? Yeah. And I think that's just the ongoing management fee, you know, that you have to pay, you know, 5% of your weekly income, um, sorry, of your monthly income as a property investor. Um, there's also other ongoing fees like council rates, body corporate fees, water, insurance, um, special levies. I mean, I just got noticed that there's going to be a special levy to raise a bit of money. So there are those ongoing fees, which you need to think about. But then you also got to think about the, the round trip cost of actually buying and particularly selling. Uh, and I've read some information that it could be as much as 7% once you include, you mm. know, stamp duty, conveyancing, agent fees, advertising. And I think that's one of the biggest um, cumbersome uh, features of property is just how costly it is. Um, whereas ETFs don't have that same level of, of cost. Um, to use the management fee that you spoke about, Owen, instead of paying 5%, I mean, most ETFs, um, the weighted average fee here in Australia is less than 0.4%. So you're paying a fraction of the cost um, and that's it. That is literally the only fee you will pay. Some ETFs have performance fees and there's spreads, but there's not going to be hidden costs involved with something like that. You can get access to a property ETF for like 16 basis points, 0.16%, or a global property ETF for 0.15%. Um, so, you know, there's single digit dollars that you're paying. Some brokerage platforms are free. 
low capital level um, required to enter ETFs. Um, and just for a lot of people who want to save for a house deposit, it's now taking up to, um, I think, 11 years. I think I, I, I read a study that talks about saving enough for a house mm. deposit. No, not so much a, a problem for retirees who have that equity, um, but those who don't have that time on their side. And if you look at like the median dwelling um, price to income ratio in, in, in the likes of Sydney, you're talking about eight or nine or even up to 10 times um, your income to actually get into the, the property market. Melbourne's a little bit lower, but when you're looking 10 to 20 years ago, it was five to 6%. Um, so yeah, overall, I think um, it's, it's, and it's not just, we, we talked about this before, Owen, but it's not just the financial cost, but also the um, emotional cost. And even if you outsource it to a, a property manager, you still have to be actively involved in making decisions, you know, about, mm. you know, the property manager calls you saying, Owen, um, what do I do about this? Here's this um, issue. Do you, and you still have to make the decisions. Um, so you, even though there is a middle person, um, there is that cost and time effort overall. But the great thing about ETFs, very low cost management fee, no hidden surprises. The buy and sell is really cheap in terms of tight spreads. Um, so yeah, the gives a big tick of approval um, and a big win mm. in the win column for ETFs over property. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm, there's these things on social media, on Facebook and whatever that are going around at the moment, the videos of when the landlord comes to repair the house and in particular when the landlord comes to paint. And it just shows a picture of like a like an architrave or a wall, and the landlord just has the paint and just paints straight over all of the all of the dust, all of the dirt that's on the wall, and just think, yep, that's done. She'll be right. Move on. But um, it's one of those things. And I was actually trying to get the latest data on this. It's funny how the um the internet lords actually follow us. But I found on loans.com.au, this was from a couple of months ago. They suggested that the the average house price in Australia was nine hundred and sixty thousand. But then when I jumped onto Instagram, another Facebook property. Um, I, I saw a report by Alan Collar, actually, who I caught up with last week uh, at, for the ABC, and he actually found that um, Perth and Adelaide, as of this week, early September, um, those two uh, cities were more expensive than Melbourne, and that's because more people are buying houses there where we're seeing the median price come down in, in Melbourne because of units. There's a lot more units similar to Sydney, not as many, but similar. But interestingly, Mark, the, we're talking about retirement. I thought this was really interesting because a lot of people who own a property, who own a home are thinking, yeah, I've got all this wealth in my property, but I need to diversify, which we'll come to in just a sec, because there's so much of my personal wealth in this one thing that's not producing any income for me. So perhaps I downsize and the government's brought in particular schemes for people that you can Google. Um, and then what do you do with that extra money? In my opinion, that should go to ETFs, whether it's inside your super or whether it's outside your super environment. Go to ETFs, ETFs because of all the features we're about to mention. Number three, Mark, is diversification. Talk to us about this. Well, you kind of gave me a good, uh, good leading uh, indicator for it, um, Owen. But yeah, you, you just said that um, when you're buying, uh, particularly most people have um, one property. If you look at the actual data, um, I think it's like 70% of investors hold one investment property. I think about 20% hold two and 5% hold three or more. So we're talking about most people have one property, but you really are buying one property in one country, in one state, in one suburb, on one street. So really there's that high level of concentration risk. Um, and the great thing, and look, that, that could be a blue chip property. It could do extremely well. You could know the area quite well. But as you mentioned, you know, there is not just one property market in Australia. There's markets within markets. You just talked about the... The pendulum swi switching away from Melbourne to the likes of Darwin, Adelaide, um, and that could change. You know, um, Perth as well. A big cyclical mining boom really dictates the pricing over there. Um, so I think that for, for investors, we did talk about, especially those in retirement who don't want to be too concentrated and have multiple sources of income, having a, a spread across different sectors. So even if you're focusing on income in particular, you can get income from um, other types of sectors as well. Um, if you look at it, just a basic Australian share ETF, it has around about 7% allocation to property or real estate stocks. Globally, it's a 2% allocation, so a little bit smaller. Um, but you get that diversification around different sectors. But also, you can get within these property ETFs known as REITs or real estate investment trusts, um, you can get diversified access to different types of property assets, whether it's in retail, whether it's in office, whether it's in industrial. So you get this nice little mix um, because if one sector fails and there's been a little bit of hesitation around what is you know working from home and COVID meant for office, but other areas like industrial and people who own things like data centers has um, really driven a lot of the return. So 
by allowing your, yourself to invest in ETFs, you're going to be allowed to invest in property. You may not be able to physically touch it and actually knock on the door, but you get a much more diversified exposure to multiple sources of income by holding a diverse set of companies in a diverse set of sectors in a diverse set of countries. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really important principle, um, particularly for those in retirement, because there's so many unknowns um, that diversification is a key pillar in your investment strategy. Yeah, I really like that. Um... We had a professor, associate professor, Sam Wiley, uh, over on our Australian finance podcast a few years ago. Um, and he, uh, teaches at Melbourne uni, teaches economics. And he, he said that you want to be ne really narrow in your career and really diversified in your wealth. Um, because being niche and being specialized in your career is how you earn a lot of money. And then being diversified is how you minimize risk, but continue to get that upside. Um, I love that. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good um, way to, to phrase it. Um, there is two, these two next points are quite related to each other. Um, maybe we can take them in turn, but I'll just say what they are now so people are aware. Number four is predictable income. And number six in, on our list, because I'm doing it a different way, is relatively better yield. So when we talk about ETFs, let's take them one at a time, Mark. We're talking about predictable income. People, as they approach retirement, want income but they might be unfamiliar or even scared of the stock market generally. So how do you answer that from an ETF perspective? Really great question. And there's so many unknowns in the world. Um, but one of the uh, clear evidence that shows is that dividends have been a fantastic way uh, to source um, wealth within the share market. Mm. In Australia in particular, um, the over half of the return over the last couple of decades has been attributable to dividends. So, you know, there, there are some companies like some of the big banks have had negative capital returns over that period. So the, the share market has really been driven a lot from dividends. Um, and, you know, speaking of reading on the news, you may hear that, that, you know, the share market gets quoted in points, all these weird numbers. That is just the, the price index of what the um, actual share market is. It doesn't include the dividends, uh, which includes things that you, you might hear things like the accumulation index or once dividends or the total return are included. So dividends are a very important part of mm -hmm. investing when you think about your total return. And even though dividends can dry up, like some companies, because dividends is just a decision from a, a company to actually pay that to their shareholders. Yeah. They can dry up, but it has been a consistent source of income. Um, on the property side, you know, whilst you do have, um, especially in, you know, in, in, in Australia, vacancy rates are near record lows. I mean, here in Sydney, they're like one, 2%. So it is quite easy to find a tenant, um, but sometimes tenants vacate. You know, sometimes there may be issues. Um, they, may, they may want relief. Um, then your property is vacant for a period. You then have to advertise it. So you don't get that same level of predictability um, because you are relying on a tenant to not just um, be in there for 12, however long your lease is, but to make those payments. Um, whereas with ETFs, they are a, a unit structure where all the income that comes from the underlying companies gets passed through to you as the investor. Mm. So you can invest in um, just broad share market um, ETFs, fixed income ETFs that pay income, or even dividend-focused ETFs. Um, and we've got a, an ETF um, with the ticker ZYAU, which is paying a yield of around about 6%, and it actually doesn't invest in any property stocks. It invests in financials, materials, and a whole bunch of different sectors. Mm. Um, overall, I think the biggest thing for income predictability is having a, a, a diversified um, source of different income-producing assets across multiple areas, and we spoke about that before. But that's why I think ETFs have that bit more predictability when it comes to achieving income for those in retirement. Yeah. So we are comparing ETFs, which are kind of like a basket for people, as you mentioned. Uh, it's kind of like, the, the, probably the, we're comparing that to property, but there's like this little thing in the middle, which we should say is like stock picking, which is picking individual stocks. Um, and this might be like you buy BHP, like a lot of our community that are a bit older, Mark, as you can imagine, hold BHP, CSL, CBA, NAV, Westpac, whatever the list goes on. Um, great companies, but you now have a decision where you can go, I could have one stock and be exposed to iron ore completely, like Fortescue's paid wonderful dividends for the last five years. Prior to that, not so much. But now I can make a decision. If I go into my retirement where I may not be as interested in the stock market or what's the latest in Chinese steel mill you know, index, whatever, um, you can say, I'm going to spread that over X number of shares through an ETF, just one purchase into one ETF, and it will diversify for me. And like you said, it's multiple sources of income. So you mentioned ZYAU. I'm going to test you here. Sorry, Mark. This is an ETF that we spoke about in the last um, conversation you and I had and proved to be really popular. Um, 
roughly how many stocks are inside that ETF? So when, when you're investing in, in an ETF, like stock concentration can be a good thing, um, but it, c- it can also be a bad thing as well. Because sometimes if you just want to invest for like capital growth, uh, as, a, as an example, it can make sense to have, um, you know, a few stocks in your portfolio. So we have a lot of products that have, you know, quite concentrated mm. por- portfolios within like, like our FANG ETF, a- as an example. But when you're talking about dividend paying stocks, you really want exposure to um, a handful of companies. And that's why, for example, our um, ZYU ETF holds about 50 companies, right? Yeah. Um, it distributes quarterly um, and it also doesn't have, um, it has a particular stock cap as well. So you're not going to um, go above a certain, that same level of concentration overall. Um, and it also doesn't take too many bets within sectors. So when you're looking for a dividend ETF paying around about, I think the yield from memory is around about 6% um, over the last 12 months getting exposure to a range of different sectors, um, it's quite a good value proposition for, um, mm. for retirees. Um, and you do get exposure to franking credits as well. Yeah, that's the big question that often follows. It's like, I hear about these franking credits or I love franking credits. If I'm already invested in shares, do I still get them? The answer is yes, because the unit trust just passes through. Um, right. you do, some people, you do need to be mindful that some of the more exotic types of structures, some of the active funds, for example, can lose some of the franking credits depending on their investment strategy. But for the most part, Yes, ETF investors still get franking credits, which rejoice everyone. Don't worry about that. Um, now let's talk about number six. You mentioned before, um, we mentioned like relatively better yields. Relatively, we're talking about relative to residential property, which is how a lot of Aussies have traditionally built wealth, which is, you know, I buy my property, I pay it off. Maybe I look at buying another one, or maybe I just hold the one that I currently have and maybe I could rent it out. Maybe I could do something else. But can you talk to us about that rental yield versus what is attainable without, you know, reaching for the stars. You already mentioned 6% from that's only one thing you'd obviously have a diversified portfolio. Talk to us about that. Talk to us about that now. Yeah. And I think there are different um, asset classes when you think about both defensive and growth asset classes that can pay yields. When you're thinking about property, I mean, yields have compressed a little bit um, over the last um, 5, 10, 20 years, but that's mainly been a virtue of, you know, rising prices that we've seen within Australia. So yields were historically, if you look 10 to 20 years ago, around about four, maybe five percent. Now you're looking at yields of around about three, three to four percent in property. Mm. Um, nationally, I think I looked at the data was about three point seven percent. And when you look at just the capital cities, it's three point five. Sydney's a little bit lower. I think Sydney's down at three point one. Whereas we talked about the different markets and different regions, Darwin's at like six or seven percent. So you can oh, well. get different um, yields within the property market too. But if you just take nationally, we're talking, let's call it that three and a half percent, that's lower than the risk-free rate that the RBA currently has, you know, and even though we're kind of moving towards a rate cutting environment, you could potentially get a better yield on cash or fixed income, you know, investing in boring bonds that retirees may be quite familiar with. Um, And they can range anywhere from, you know, government bond yields yielding around about three and a half to four percent, yielding all the way up to, you know, high yielding bonds at around seven or eight percent. Um, share market as well is a great way, even though dividend yields have compressed, um, shares are still yielding around about four or 5% once you include franking credits. We introduced a banking credit product bank, um, a, a couple mm. of months ago that yields also around about 6% as well. And that holds the, the bonds or the debt that's within a, a in a bank itself. So the, 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 the tough thing as well, Owen, about the yields that you hear in, um, property yields around three and a half or 4%. Um, they don't really include the cost involved. I was going to say, yeah, it's gross cost. Yeah. And um, whereas when you think about the ETFs, that's kind of all encompassing after fees, which you get a lot more transparency. Um, and, and speaking of total returns, you know, the, the, the hard evidence shows that the share market returns around about call it nine, 10 or 11% per year over a long period of time. Um, and so you get your capital and your dividends, but there's no real maintenance fees to extract more value. You, you'll pay a fee potentially mm. to an ETF, but it's a very low cost. Whereas um, I've seen some research showing property can return, you know, relatively same amount, call it eight or 9% a year. Um, but that includes improvements made to the property. And we talked about, you know, renovating and, and fixing right. it up, but it doesn't include um, all that cost that you put in, you know, so really think about it as, a, as an after cost. Um, and an after-tax total return basis. So factoring things like servicing costs, all the improvements, because I think that's one misleading um, data point where you, you kind of can't do the same within ETFs. You can't, you know, manufacture or, um, you know, renovate the ETF to make it enhance returns. Um, mm-hmm. We can get on leverage and in uh, another uh, topic, but that's different to property. So when you're thinking about total returns, it, it's really got to think about the all-encompassing cost as well. 
Yeah, I love that when people are like, you know, I get a rental return and blah, 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 blah. Um, the, I think the big, like I said, the top of the show, and we'll talk about this in just a moment about leverage, is like the big benefit of property is using loans, you know, for your advantage, particularly when you're in the accumulation phase, because you can use the property to kind of get more exposure. You've got the income to service that. When you go into retirement, it's not about tipping money into your wealth bucket. It's about making the wealth bucket give you money because you're turning off your salary. And so that's where the apples to apples comparison comes comes in. And, and we're not saying necessarily older people. I know a lot of people, Mark, in their 40s, 50s that plan to retire early. They're actively considering five to 10 years ahead of time. How do I deleverage my portfolio now, start to do it over many years to get into ETFs to produce positive cash flow? One of the things you mentioned and we mentioned before was um, franking credits. A lot of people are unsure uh, we did talk about this last time, but you're the income specialist, so I'll ask you again. Uh, we did talk about this in the last video about like the tax, uh, I guess, how the tax kind of works inside of an ETF. But one of the, the items that we've got on our list is tax efficiency. Can you talk about the benefits of ETFs in that regard? Yeah. So we'll talk, talk about franking credits first, because that's very important. Um, so with property, you obviously don't get the, the franking credits. You don't get to benefit from the double taxation um, of some of the companies that are, that are paying out their, uh, their dividends from their earnings. But really, franking credits are, are, are a way that uh, investors can reduce their overall tax burden. Um, and that's particularly important for those uh, in pension phase where uh, mm. retirees may not be paying tax at all. Um, whereas when you have things like whether it's like rental income, capital gains, especially if it's not your principal place of residence, that can create uh, significant taxes. Um, not just that, but then you've also got other taxes as well. You've got, I mean, Owen, you're, you're the expert in this given your local residence in Melbourne, but I've been hearing about the punitive land taxes oh, um, on value yeah. in Melbourne. And I think I read, and that's, I guess, why one of the reasons Melbourne's uh, growth hasn't kept up with some of the other um, states. But I, I read a crazy stat, Owen, that um, if you look at like the top marginal rate of land tax in Victoria, um, when you include like the high value properties, if it's held in trust, if it's a potential foreigner, you're paying a tax of like 7%, which yep. is outrageous in my opinion. Um, and that just eats into your returns. Um, so I guess that's the tax efficiency of ETFs is you get that embedded, um, I guess, uh, the franking credits benefit um, when it comes to um, selling ETFs and that ties into liquidity. You could actually sell ETFs in smaller increments, which uh, almost like dollar cost averaging out um, can spread out the capital gains mm -hmm. implications over long periods of time. Whereas if you sell a property in one state, at one stage, that financial year, you are going to have a big tax bill. So that idea of, you know, decumulating over time can spread out your capital gains. Um, and a lot of people will always say to me, Owen, well, think about the negative gearing con uh, considerations. You know, that's the big benefit of property. And I get it. It, 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 is, a, it is a benefit. We have one of the few countries um, in the world that, that does have this system. But whilst it may provide tax benefits during, I guess, that accumulation phase for property investors, it's not as relevant for those in retirees, given that retirees are really focusing on income rather than generating losses, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I think that depending on where you are in your life stage, the negative gearing does kind of outweigh or, um, you know, there, there's, there's some areas where it may be more important. Um, and the final point I just raised, Owen, is just around um, simplicity around tax reporting. We were talking about this before. Um, the good mm. thing about an ETF is, um, you know, you get one consolida consolidated statement at the end of the financial year, making tax reporting just a little bit easier and less complicated. Whereas when you're managing taxes on an investment property, you've got things like, you know, your rental income, your depreciation reports, your deductions. It's just a little bit more complex and may require a bit more additional tax advice, cost and effort. So ETFs just have a little bit more simplicity when it comes to tax efficiency. Um, and just in general, just because they low turnover compared to, I mean, we're not talking about property, but other funds. Uh, they generally have less capital gains implications too. I like that you uh, mentioned that annual tax statement that people get as well. It just makes life so much easier for people. You know what I'm really finding, Mark, is um, a lot of our uh, listeners in our community at Raska now they're not doing like the thing that was really popular like five or ten years ago or even twenty years ago, which was buy an investment property using equity. Now they're thinking, how can I use ETFs with my primary residence to to redraw and then use that? It's it's kind of like equity release slash debt recycling, however you want to phrase it. But that is becoming seriously, seriously popular. Popular. A lot of our community are reaching out to financial advisors and accountants to get help with that. But I think that's more the increase in financial literacy 
the proliferation of ETFs and the obvious benefits of them, people are now seeing that as the alternative, as a probably better alternative than the other option, which is having multiple properties and it's more somewhat in, in a vanity metric. Um, so cognizant of time here, mate, we've got two, three more to go. The next one um, was access to global markets. So you mentioned this earlier on when you talked about diversification. You mentioned FANG as well. Talk to us about using ETFs in this way. I think the great thing about um, when you're investing in, well, I guess when you're investing in property, it really limits you to local markets unless you have, you know, mm -hmm. some complex overseas investments or active funds purchasing things like commercial property. But, you know, the Australian market does dance to its own tune sometimes compared to other property markets for better or worse, just depends. Um, if you're looking to expand overseas into property, you may need to get a buyer's agent to do the research for you overseas. You may have to exchange currencies as well. Um, whereas yeah. that's a little bit different when it comes to ETFs. You have a locally domiciled product in Australia. So it's a fund listed in Australia. It's um, denominated in Australian dollars. You don't have to exchange currencies. Um, and you can get global exposure, whether it's into global shares, like we talked about the big fang names um, who are driving a lot of the share market. You could also get global property exposure as well. Um, uh, however, you know, many active funds tend to be quite expensive. That's why ETFs are a little bit better. They track an index, about 80 to 90% of active funds underperform um, just a broad index, even a property market index over the long term. So to access global companies and to regionally diversify, ETFs tick that box. Yeah, absolutely. And you still get the tax report as well, which is key for a lot of people. Report. Yeah, because if you get the locally domiciled ETF, it's it's the same as any other one, which is really good. So, yeah. and, and um, not just that, Earl, but you, while also you get franking credits in Australia, you also get um, foreign income tax offsets as well, which also helps reduce your tax liability for any tax paid overseas or within one Australian product or within one financial statement. So a lot that's, simpler. That's, that's it. Um, that's one of the benefits of using ASX listed ETFs as well, or Australian listed ETFs, rather than going abroad and finding an ETF overseas somewhere. Well, that can be perfectly valid for some people. The simplicity of the Australian ones to get the global exposure makes a lot of sense to me. Got two more points. Um, we've got number nine, which is, as we said before, an advantage, but it could also be a disadvantage, which is the borrowing. So there's no borrowing risk, risk necessarily with an ETF. There's also no interest rate sensitivity. Talk us through this, Mark. Yeah, so there's, I guess there's two parts there, Owen, both around borrowing risk and interest rate sensitivity and conscious of time. So I'll, I'll get through this as quickly as I can. Um, but when you have, for example, higher mortgage rates, as, as we've seen here in Australia, for property investors, this obviously means higher mortgage payments. If you're on a variable rate loan, um, we don't have the 30 year, 60 year loans like the US do. Um, and that can erode your rental income because if your rental income isn't growing as much as uh, mm. the same pace as the interest rate, well, then you're going to be left behind. And that's where we've seen this rental crisis really stem from. Um, whereas ETFs are a bit more diversified across um, multiple sectors that can benefit in both a falling and a rising rate environment. So when you're thinking of sectors that do well in falling, you can think about like tech, technology, consumer discretionary, a property, you can invest in property ETFs. Whereas in a rising rate environment, you're looking a bit more defensive um, areas like financials, energies, um, materials, uh, industrials. So um, bond ETFs as well can also work quite well because they adjust to interest rate changes, especially floating rate notes. And that's where we've seen a lot of popularity over the last year. Um, and then on your borrowing risk side, Owen, you mentioned, I mean, leverage works in both ways. It works on the way up and on the way down. So Australian property really hasn't had a bear market over the last, you know, 30 years or so. During the GFC, I think the property market was down, you know, 5 6%, 2011, the Euro debt crisis also like 5 or 6%. 2019, a little bit more because there was a uh, worried, funnily enough, about a tax reason um, as negative hmm. gearing getting abolished. Share markets can be more volatile. We saw during COVID a fall 30 or 40%. Um, so yes, you don't have that same borrowing risk um, within an ETF. That being said, um, you can get internally geared ETFs. And I know you've done some shows around gearing and uh, around uh, leveraged ETFs as well, um, where you don't have to be worried about margin calls. Um, but from a property standpoint, let's say you don't meet your, your payments, you could have to um, force sell your property or deal with repossession risk as well. Whereas ETFs, you know, you, you just have the, your management that, that comes out of the NAV, so you don't really pay it. Um, and if you fail to meet those loan payments, well, then yeah, yeah you may be forced to uh, sell your property. It's not the mm -hmm. same for ETFs. You don't have to meet those payments and kind of uh, have to deal with that interest rate sensitivity as well. I'm yet to meet um, someone in their 60s or 70s, Mark, who says to me, oh, you know, I don't, it doesn't bother me that I have a mortgage. Um, everyone that I speak to that 
is truly retired. So not like one of the early retirees where it might still have make sense to have some debt in your life, but genuine retirees later in life. I'm yet to meet one that would rather have a mortgage than not. Like so actually the the I think the the borrowing makes a lot of sense early in life. And then as you, you progress, like you said, you just don't want those headaches. Just get rid of them. Get on with life. Live life to your fullest. Don't w- worry about whether interest rates are going up or, you know, all those types of things. Um, number 10, at risk of being somewhat anticlimactic here, we, we want to make sure that we get this point across, which is this idea of price discovery and transparency. You mentioned this at the very top of the show, Mark, which was this idea that, you know, ETFs, they're there. They're in front of you. People can visit the GlobalX ETFs website. There will be a link in the show notes. You can go there and you can see what's inside. Bank, ZYAU, Bank. What else is there to know about this? Yeah, transparency is key. When you're buying every any investment, you want to know what's under the hood. Um, property is a little bit more opaque in that area where you can't actually see what's under the hood. Let's say you're interested in a particular property and you don't know what's actually in it. Are there any structural issues? What's the, um, the, the layout of the property? A little bit harder. Um, ETFs do price in information from a price discovery perspective a lot quicker. It's the benefit of being in an efficient market. Um, and I guess the, the benefit, I guess, of illiquidity or property is that, you know, there's not going to be as much um, volatility within these prices, but that's because there's no real mark to market that's happening every single day. It's just buyers and sellers coming together. Um, so the, the stock market does a really good job at pricing in information. Um, and then the one thing around um, I guess also uh, transparency is we talked about it before, Owen, but ETFs have a very simple calculation for that total return. You just get your capital growth, you add your dividends and you minus your fees. Whereas property is, we talked about it before, all the up- upkeep and all the costs, you actually don't know what your end total return is. So from a transy perspective, ETFs, highly transparent, clear, regular updates and they're holding their performance. Um, property may require an expert valuation or an estimates of value. You look on domain and real estate, what's this property worth? You contact the, the, you know, the, even the guide of buying a property, contact agent. Where's the transparency there? It's just, it's just ridiculous. Um, mm. and, and also from a comparison perspective, ETFs are very easy to compare um, against one another. Properties are a little bit different because whilst you have comparable sales, every single property is different. Um, and we, we just launched our um, ETF landscape report, which talks oh, about yeah. all the different ETFs in the ecosystem. And you can compare price, performance, exposure, what index does it has? Is it hedged? Is it unhedged? You're just getting a lot more of a systematized, simplistic way of comparing investments, but also providing that discovery and all important transparency that people want to see in their investments. I remember when I inspected a property, um, I was like pretty keen on this property, Mark, and I, I said, I want to look in the roof. So I'm, I, I consider myself, um, I know enough about like carpentry to be dangerous, put it that way. Um, and uh, I remember looking in the roof and um, well, like just saying, can I look in the roof? And the real estate agent said, oh, there's actually no manhole, so you can't look up there. And I was like, well, how am I going to know if there's anything up there? And then I was crawling under the floor. But what I realized was actually when I did this one inspection, people had strategically placed rugs on the ground where there was broken floor and like there were things that were obviously wrong, like water damage and stuff. And that just comes back to the transparency. If you go to the GlobalX website, you can literally see all of the holdings. That's not only more impressive than probably compared to property, but it's also more impressive than compared to super funds. Like super funds, the big super funds don't like to necessarily show you exactly what you own. And same with uh, active fund managers for their own secret source. They don't show you what's inside. So you can do that with an ETF. That's a transparency point. Now, and, and just to add on that, Owen, because I know we're just conscious of time, you can actually see like the underlying holders in the company and do your own research. So, you know, what are their debt levels like? What are their earnings like on the actual bonds that you might be holding? Mm. You can see the credit quality of each of those individual bonds, which get rated doesn't happen the same in property. You know, you might have to get a, like a building and pest inspection, uh, expert uh, surveyance to come in. Like it, you just don't have that same level of transparency. And I've heard a lot of horror stories of people buying a property, realizing some of the defects available or realizing some of the issues structurally, and then they had to deal with it. Um, so yeah, pr- property, there are sometimes hidden surprises. You don't really get the same in ETS because you can actually see everything mm. that's in the underlying. Um, you've mentioned three ETFs in particular today. You got the FANG ETF, which is available. Um, we'll put a link in the show notes for the, all of these funds, as well as the landscape report that you mentioned, which shows all ETFs. Um, but FANG, which my co-host on the Saturday show, Drew Meredith, is probably his greatest call of all time. Um, ZYAU, which is the, the high yielding ETF that um, was also mentioned in the last episode. 
Bank, which is B-A-N-K. Is that, is that correct? That's the right. Yep. So those are the three ETFs we've called out today. Uh, and you can go and test all the transparency on the Globalux website. Um, also, I'll put a link in the show notes to the last episode. Uh, if you think that we've missed anything, if you've watched this and you've said, hey, you missed this, or hey, Mark said this, um, Owen said that, let us know. Jump into the comments, you know, get in touch. We love to hear from you. Um, we are both property owners, and that's the the irony of this. So we are both property owners, so we are in this with you, um, and we love all types of investing. So just let us know. Mark, my final question for you is, you know, we've covered a lot. We've said ETFs have, you know, they're, they're faster to transact, lower cost, diversification, predictable income, and the list goes on and on and on. I would like to ask you, we've covered a lot. What's one thing that you would like listeners or viewers to take away from listening to today's episode? One thing they can do, one thing they can check. What's one thing? Yeah, it's um, it's it's a really good question, Owen. I think one thing, and you said it, we're both property and ETF investors. The one thing that I've realized is um, this great Australian dream of owning a property, whilst it has been the great, a great source of wealth creation over time, it really isn't the be-all and end-all. And we've spoken about a lot of the reasons why. Um, and some of the horror stories and pitfalls around the financial stress it can cause. Um, but for those in retirement, I really want to um, hone in on this, that creating a diversified stream of income producing assets is one of the most important things to really protect you during those, you know, last years of your life where you really want to enjoy it and have a very much a passive approach to not worrying about how your money is being managed. So ETFs do provide, you know, great control, fewer headaches. Um, great long-term outcomes. And um, in retirement, it's not just about owning those particular assets, but making sure that those assets are really um, working for you in the most efficient way possible. So diversify where you can, do your research, speak to your financial advisor, ask about these options. You know, Don't just be so focused on, is it property versus shares? I think both have a really important part in your portfolio. Um, and I'm very keen as well, Owen, for people to, to comment in the section who have, who have both property and shares in their portfolio, because you and I are both learning on this property journey as well, as we approach eventual retirement as well, um, tell us about your experiences as well. Um, but I think that the sleep, at, the sleep at night factor is one of the most important things for me. And if I can sleep at night, knowing I have diversified income sources to keep me through those formidable years towards the end, um, that to me is, is a recipe for success. Yeah, absolutely. You've said it well, the diversified sources of income. One thing we didn't even mention was estate planning and setting it up for your next um, you know, the next generation, if that's what you want to do, or even your partner, your spouse, whatever. Um, that's another thing. That's 11. Um, but I'll put um, all 10 of these in the show notes. So check it out. Mark, this has been heaps of fun. I'm sure it will get um, plenty of traction online because just who you are and the education you bring, mate, we really appreciate your time. So thanks for joining me. Anytime, Owen. Great to be here and I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more.